Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Fortnite Biotech and Health Extension Group, sponsored by 100 Plus Capital. I'm very, very happy to see all of you here. We have a terribly exciting speaker today, um, whom I think we've been waiting for for almost uh, a year now to come on it. I think it's been about a year or something, uh, maybe a little bit less that we reach out to you. So thank you so, so much for joining. Um, I'm still admitting a few folks as they trickle in. Um, I just want to take maybe uh, a minute or so as we uh, as they have you here uh, to let you know that we have Fortnite's Biotech and Health Extension um, workshop coming up uh, this May. And many of you, I think, have already applied. Many of you are already, uh, ex uh, are already attending. But for those of you who aren't and who could be interested in joining, this is happening on May 21st and 22nd at IndieBio. And it's Fortnite's Longevity Tech Tree Tools and Prizes workshop. Um, it will be very, very interactive with many people that I think you know from our seminar summaries and our seminars here are joining and we'll basically just try to hash out uh, a little bit more of a collected curated list of challenges that different people in the aging field, whether it's new uh, talent or new funders, can take on as they enter the space. So if this sounds interesting, there's the application forms still out there. Uh, they are already quite full, but uh, I would really want to make sure that people in this group and get first tips at joining if they want to um, before we open it out to the larger public. All right, so that's, I think, uh, enough for me uh, today. I'm really, really, really happy to have uh, David Rubinstein here. And he's from University of Cambridge and he's joining us in today's seminar to discuss autoph autophagy and neurodegeneration. And I will I keep my intro, as I said, rather short. Uh, I will post more info about you, David, here in the chat for people to read up on, including linking to your page. Um, but then after your presentation, I think we take it as uh, we always do um, and have a pretty long uh, uh, Q&A, Q&A. So as it always happens, if that time gets short at the end of these Q&As. So if you want to make sure that your question gets asked, then ask it rather early. Okay, that's enough for me, David. I'm very excited to have you on board. Uh, your work, uh, I think, really, and uh, your reputation precedes you. Thank you so, so much for joining us. You're now a co-host and you can present whenever you're ready. And I'll be in the chat in case anyone has further questions. Thank you very much for joining us. Okay, good, thank you. So thanks for inviting me, Alison, and I'm um, looking forward to the, to the next hour. Um, today, I'm going to tell you about autophagy in the context of neurodegenerative diseases, and you'll see why this intersects with your, your interest in aging. I'm going to start off by giving a brief update on some recent cell biology on autophagy that we've done. And I think that um, one of the reasons for doing that is it's also related to disease. Um, now I'm going to describe how autophagy compromise might contribute to various age-associated neurodegenerative diseases. And I hope to end on a good note by trying to make the point that um, harnessing autophagy upregulation might be a rational therapeutic strategy for many of these conditions. This is a schematic of autophagy. Um, the first recognizable components of the pathway um, that are these cup-shaped double membrane structures called phagophores that form more or less randomly in the cytoplasm of most mammalian cells. It's more polarized in neurons. Um, and after the edges of these structures extend and fuse, you get an autophagosome that is engulfed cytoplasmic contents, which could be proteins, organelles, et cetera. These are then trafficked along microtubule to the part of the cell where the lysosomes are concentrated, the microtubule organizing center, to facilitate the fusion of autophagosomes and lysosomes and the subsequent degradation of the autophagic contents by the lysosomal enzymes. One of the key questions in the field is to try to understand how autophagosomes are built and specifically which membranes contribute to the phagophores. And um, over the years, my lab has argued that endocytic processes are very important, but others have shown that um, other um, compartments contribute, like the ER, the Golgi, the secretory pathway, for instance. Um, and, and most recently, we've shown that the recycling endosome, the structure shown in green, is a core platform on which autophagosomes form. The newly formed autophagosomes are these structures in yellow on the recycling endosome and the liberated ones are shown in red. This is a whole mount electron micrograph showing the same with the same color code. This is the 
a schematic showing the biochemistry that underlies some of the arguments we've made in favor of this um, process occurring on the recycling endosome. So the recycling endosome is a tubular vesicular structure that um, originate, what well, doesn't originate, it, it sort of derives from the endocytic pathway. Um, and the defining event in order fibrosome biogenesis is the conjugation of this ubiquitin-like protein called LC3 to phosphatidylethylolamine on the nascent autophagosome membrane. The sites of conjugation are determined by um, a ligase complex containing proteins, including ATG16L1, and the localization of this complex is determined in turn by its interactions with another protein called WIPI2. So WIPI2 localization determines where LC3 is going to be deposited on membranes. And the WIPI2 localization we found was determined by what is co considered a coincidence detection. So it's, it's an interaction of two different components. The one component is the snippet phosphatid alinositol 3 phosphate, and the other component is RAB11A, which is a marker protein for the recycling endosome. So, um, that explains why the recycling endosome um, ends up being the membranes on which this core event in autophagy occurs. After this happens, you need to generate changes in this tubular vesicular structure and ultimately scission of the nascent autophagosome from the recycling endosome compartment. So a key question is, what does that? And we found that dynamin 2 um, binds to LC3 in this compartment, and dynamin 2 actually enables the scission and release of the autophagosomes from this compartment. And it's interesting that a mutation in dynamin 2 that gives you a muscle disease called citronuclemyopathy um, results in compromise of this particular step. The reason we've worked a lot on trying to understand the basics of autophagy is that my lab has been interested for many decades now in late onset neurodegenerative diseases. And all of these conditions shown in the slide manifest with the accumulation of toxic proteins in the cell um, and they form aggregates. And I tend to liken this to a situation where the rubbish is not collected in certain European cities. And um, you can see that this mound of trash um, is not good for the city. It's causing traffic havoc, but it's also probably the home to um, rather deleterious fauna and flora. So um, in that sense, um, over the last two, three decades, my lab has been very interested in see if we can find ways of enhancing the removal of the mutant proteins or the misfolded proteins that contribute to these aggregates in these various diseases relative to the wild type counterparts. And in the early years of the century, we found that autophagy was important for um, the clearance of many of the proteins in the previous slide. It's important for um, the polyglutamine expanded proteins that give you Huntington's disease and certain spina cerebellae ataxia. It's important for tau, which um, in its wild type form contributes to Alzheimer's disease and point mutations give you frontotemporal dementia and alpha salucrine, which is the culprit causing many forms of Parkinson's disease. We found that if we slowed the formation of autophagosomes or the fusion of the autophagosomes with lysosomes, we impeded the clearance of the aggregate precursors. And in doing so, we increased the accumulation of both soluble and aggregated species of these proteins and thereby enhanced their toxicity, both in cell and a wide range of animal models from Drosophila to zebrafish to mice. So one of the questions we've been interested in trying to understand is whether lesions that cause neurodegeneration are associated with impaired autophagy. Um, and actually the most common lesion and the most important lesion contribution to um, neurodegeneration is aging. And so recently, Sergeant so Park and Becca Freak in my lab have worked on this um, using an autophagy reporter mouse that we made which allows us to assess the numbers of autophagosomes and the number of autolysosomes, which allows us to infer autophagic flats. And we measured them in the cortex of mice as their age. And you can see at 18 and 24 months, there's a significant decrease in autophagy in the brain compared to at younger ages. 
And um, we, by, by looking at expression profiles in the mice, as well as in um, aged normal humans, um, we searched for genes that might be able to account for this change. And, and the gene that we focused on was a gene called um, SORBS3, which encodes a protein called venexin. And um, we found that its expression went up with age in both humans and mice. And we determined that this caused decreased autophagy by impeding um, YAPTAS signaling. And I'm happy to describe the, the molecular details of this um, in the question time if anybody's interested. So this is, you know, one contributor that might um, account for this decrease in autophagy in mammalian ages, in, uh, with mammalian age in the brain. We've also, like another number of other groups, been trying to understand whether mutations um, causing neurodegenerative diseases are associated with impaired autophagy. And this is a busy slide, but the point is um, that the slide illustrates a color code. So the situations in blue represent diseases that we worked on where there's a defect in the formation of autophagosomes. On the other hand, um, the red disease describes a situation where the autophagosomes are made properly, but they're not trafficked to the part of the cell where the lysosomes are concentrated. And the green diseases exemplified by lysosome storage diseases, which are the most common neurodegenerative diseases in childhood, uh, are situations where the lysosomes don't work properly, either causing defective autophagosome lysosome fusion or um, impaired degradation of the autophagic contents within the lysosome. So the, the bottom line from this slide is that different mutations causing neurodegenerative diseases can impact autophagy at different parts of its itinerary. I thought I'd tell you a one or two quick stories to describe situations in a little bit more detail. So um, the polyglutamine diseases um, are nine conditions that we know of, which are caused by very long polyglutamine tract system mutation um, in different neurodegenerative diseases. The most common is Huntington's disease, and the second most common is spina cerebellae ataxia. So one of the genetic phenomena that occurs in this disease is that once you pass a threshold of a certain number of glutamines, normally around 35 to 40, then you have a disease mutation. Um, and there's a very similar threshold across all nine diseases. I've just shown five of them to simplify the, 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 the figure. The second point that's important is that the longer the number of glutamines, the earlier the age of onset. And this phenomenon, again, is seen in all of these diseases. So um, a key question in the field has been to understand whether there's a common underlying mechanism that is working across all of these nine diseases. And the first mechanism everybody thought of was that these proteins tend to aggregate. And um, this is a figure from a seminal paper from Marion de Villiers' lab in Huntington's disease, where she showed juvenile onset cases have these aggregates in the nucleus. But the most common forms of the disease, the typical Huntington's disease, accounting for about 80% of patients, have aggregates outside the nucleus in the cell. Um, but the idea that the big aggregates visible by light microscopy were the toxic species or were primarily accounting for this, was challenged by a study from Steve Finkbeiner's lab who used live cell microscopy to study the phenomenon of aggregation in cells in relation to the propensity to die after expressing mutant Huntington. And his lab found that the cells that formed the aggregates were actually, and counterintuitively at the time, less likely to die than the ones that, um, that didn't form aggregates. So, the minimal interpretation of their data is that cells expressing mutant Huntington that has not formed visible aggregates um, can have toxicity. And so we wanted to understand if the generic pathogenic consequences of expanded polyglutamine tract in the different diseases that are distinct or that can be uncoupled from um, the large aggregate formation that you see by microscopy. The second question, uh, which is something I've been interested in ever since I came to Cambridge and started working on these diseases, was what are the roles of the normal polyglutamine stretches? Because all of us have normal polyglutamine stretches in the Huntington's disease, the spinocerebellar ataxia type 3 disease, uh, gene 
disease, it's uh, protein, <coughs> etc. And these are very widely conserved in evolution. And so um, Avi Ashkenazi in my lab studied a taxon three, which caused the second most common disease in this group, um, spina cerebellae ataxia type three. Um, but he studied the wild type, the normal protein. Um, and um, he found that it impacts the levels of another protein called Becklin-1. So Becklin-1 is this protein shown in yellow. And Becklin-1 is part of a complex that I'll describe a little bit more later that generates the lipid phosphated alinositol 3 phosphate that is important for autophagosome biogenesis. Becklin-1 can be ubiquitinated and this would serve as degradation signal through the proteasome, but it can be protected from degradation by a taxon 3, which is a de ubiquitinase. So the a taxon 3 removes the degradation signal from Becklin 1 and um, enables Becklin 1 to have a longer half life. So if you lose a taxon 3 function, you get more rapid Becklin 1 degradation and less autophagosome biogenesis. The ability of a taxon 3, of wild type a taxon 3, to protect Becklin 1 from degradation is, as one might expect, mediated in part through the ability of these two proteins to bind to each other besides the um, enzymatic functions of ataxin-3. And this binding is determined by the wild type polyglutamine stretch in ataxin-3. If you delete it and do nothing else, the protein is effectively dead in cells with regards to protecting Becker one from degradation. If you have a protein in the cell with a long polyglutamine stretch, for instance, mutant Huntington, then the protein with the long polyglutamine stretch binds more tightly to Becklin than the wild type A taxon 3 and competes it all. The consequence of that is the A taxon 3 can't protect Becklin 1 from degradation anymore, and there's less autophagosome biogenesis. So we thought that was the end of the story until Sandra Hill in the lab started working on a mutation in the gene called VCP, otherwise known as P97. Um, and she was interested in this particular gene because um, a mutation in this gene gives you a form of tauopathy um, and dementia. So Sandra found that um, VCP intersected with the mechanism I've just described because here is now Becklin as part of its complex that makes PI3P. Um, the kinase in this complex, for what it's worth, is uh, this protein VPS34. And what VCP does is it enables um, increased activity of this complex through two mechanisms. First, it binds both Becklin 1 and ataxin 3 and brings the two together. And so, in fact, enhances um, the ability of ataxin 3 to de ubiquitate at Becklin 1. But independently from this, VCP binds all the other members of the complex and brings the complex more, together more effectively, both in cells and in vitro. Um, and so this tighter binding or more rapid binding of the complex itself increases its um, PI3 kinase activity um, and its ability to drive autophagy. So here you've got a situation where both in the polyglutamine diseases, and this is a scenario we saw across a range of polyglutamine diseases, not only Huntington's disease, you've got a defect in Becklin-1 stability. You have the same type of problem with decreased PI3P production or decreased Becklin-1 stability when you've got this VCP mutation. At about the time we discovered that autophagosome biogenesis um, regulates um, the levels of these various toxic proteins shown at the top of the slide, we also found that if we enhance the formation of autophagosomes, either genetically initially and subsequently using more um, precise chemical uh, genetic tools, um, we, 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 we found that we could decrease the accumulation of these proteins and alleviate their toxicity in cells and then in a range of, of animal models, including mice. And because of that, we've undertaken a number of uh, chemical screens and more targeted approaches to identify autophagy regulators. Um, a lot of the work is focused on regulators that act independently of the mammalian target of rapamycin, mTOR. Um, and in that sense, we've discovered new pathways regulating autophagy. Um, and 
um, have demonstrated the efficacy of many of these pathways in cells, Drosophila, zebrafish, and mouse models of Huntington's disease. We've even had one compound tested is in a clinical safety trial in only Huntington's patients in Cambridge recently. Um, I want to focus um, on one hit that we progressed, and it's the hit I'm most excited about at the moment. This came from a study initially published by Andrew Williams in the lab, um, now a long time ago, where she profiled um, a library of drugs that had been used for other purposes, it's a so-called repurposing screen, to see if any of these drugs use it for other purposes, also induced autophagy. And she found that verapamil induced autophagy. Verapamil is a voltage-gated um, calcium channel blocker, an L-type calcium channel blocker. And um, we showed that um, the target of verapamil was the L-type calcium channel using a range of pharmacological strategies. Um, but we were rather disappointed when we worked out that verapamil doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. So far it profiled um, a series of L-type calcium channels that do cross the blood-brain barrier as, as well as verapamil in primary neurons from our autophagy reporter mouse and found that all of them induced autophagy um, like verapamil. She then wanted to see if the same drugs could reduce the levels of an autophagy substrate. And we here you used um, a polyglutamine protein, uh, like you'd see in Huntington's disease. And all of these reduce the levels of these pro this protein when it's transfected into primary neurons. This is the control, this is the low levels of the aggregates in the primary neurons with um, all the drugs that get into the brain, the L type calcium channel blocks that get into the brain. And these are positive controls. So with that in mind, I asked Anna Lopez, who's part of the group, and she works in zebrafish, to test whether this drug, philodipine, which had the best effect in these experiments, worked in the zebrafish. And she showed that philodipine reduced insoluble tau levels and ameliorated its neurodegenerative phenotype um, in our zebrafish tau model. Um, and this was fine, but when she put the tau transgene on an autophagy in our background, it did nothing. Uh, the philonopine did nothing, suggesting and consistent with the idea that the philonopine is acting to reduce tau toxicity in an autophagy dependent manner. We did many other experiments um, to follow this up, but um, I think the key bottom line is that we showed that philodipine could induce autophagy in the brains of mice, in Huntington's mice, and in a Parkinson's model expressing um, a mutant form of alpha synuclein, um, and in doing so could ameliorate neurodegeneration. The Parkinson's study is, um, I think, particularly um, informative because we, we, we worked very hard to ensure in this study that we mimicked the plasma levels of philodipine in the mouse. Um, so, so the plasma membranes of levels of philodipine that you'd see in a patient taking this drug for high blood pressure in the mouse model of Parkinson's disease. So we tried to do as faithful a possible repurposing as we could. And we showed that when we did this, the philodipine reduced the levels of the mutant alpha in the different parts of the brain. Um, and in parallel um, rescued the number of dopaminergic neurons and improved motor performance. So um, we're very excited by those data. Um, and along with other studies we did, we feel that um, this motivates the use of this um, compound I mean, for the studies in people. And we're just about to start an experimental medicine study in early Huntington's patients with my colleague, Roger Barker in Cambridge um, to do some a more dose finding and to see if we can affect a biomarker of Huntington in the brain um, in these patients. Um, and I, if that all works, then I think it would serve as a prelude for a suitably powerful proof of concept study. So um, I think the key messages I'd like to leave you with today is that on the one hand, I believe that autophagy upregulation might be a rational therapeutic strategy for many neurodegenerative diseases. And by removing these toxic aggregate-prone proteins in the cell. And I haven't told you about it, but there are many data from ourselves and others suggesting that um, autophagy itself very frequently protects against different cell death processes like apoptosis. Um, I've given you a flavor of the idea that it can protect against a wide range of different neurodegenerative diseases. Um, and these benefits can be achieved by a number of targets 
um, that impact autophagy. On the other hand, autophagy compromise is, is a common feature in neurodegenerative diseases. And I think it's likely to contribute to the aggregate formation and the cell stress you see in these conditions. I don't think it's necessarily the only contributor, but it, it plays a role. Um, we need to understand the biology of the disease to determine whether autophagy is going to be a good strategy or, or if autophagosobiogenesis upregulation is going to be a good strategy. So for instance, if you've got a disease where you've got a defect at the level of the lysosomes, um, it's not going to necessarily help to increase the formation of autophagosomes because they're not going to fuse effectively with the lysosomes and they might accumulate unproductively in the cells. Um, furthermore, understanding the specific disease biology might inform the best targets to drug. And again, I'm happy to describe an exemplar of that in the, in the question time. Finally, um, I've given you a bit of a whirlwind tour about its work that's been done over many years um, from my lab. Um, I've had great collaborators over the years, um, and of course, the work couldn't have been possible without the funding that we've had. So, and thank you very much for your interest. Wonderful, fantastic! That was really quite uh, the walk in a walk in the park. And uh, and 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 thank you so much for t uh, touching base on so many individual examples. Um, wonderful. We already have a few questions here in the chat. Um, thank you so 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 much for um, yeah for this really great overview. Uh, I think if you're okay, we would jump to questions right away. Would that work for you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, perhaps I'll stop sharing your screen just for now, and we may uh, end up with the screen uh, again in case you want to pinpoint a specific example. But the first question is from John Ferber. Hi, David. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet um, you too. Yes, uh, I'm. I've been very concerned about the accumulation of lipoplasin with age, especially in non-dividing cells of neurons and cardiomyocytes. And when the lysosomes get clogged up, there's no more room for new autophagosomes to fuse with them. And um, I wonder what your thoughts are about that. In other words, we could, um, we could upregulate autophagy and still not solve the problem because you'd have all of these autophagosomes um, orbiting around with no place to park. So I think it's, you know, the Lipofascan literature, as you know, is, um, has been around for a long time and it's certainly a real phenomenon. I think the difficulty is trying to understand what autophagic flux is in an old person. Um, actually, Counterintuitively, in the mice, okay, and mice aren't people. So, I, 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 no, no, it's very important that we always remember that mice aren't people. But in the old mice, they don't have the phenotype that you would describe. They don't have um, an impairment of autophagosome lysosome fusion. The primary de deficit in the mice is a problem in autophagosome biogenesis. But it can um, take 30 or 40 years for that's why I said mice aren't it people. to accumulate. Yeah. So, so I think then the next question with the lipofascin is, you know, this uh, growing literature suggesting that not all lysosomes are the same. Not everything that labels with um, the traditional lysosome markers like LAMP1 are, are active lysosomes. So I think, you know, one of the challenges I think, I, I, in terms of aging and neurodegeneration, is to try and understand exactly what you're getting at. So, is there a way we can? Um, assess real protein turnover in, um, in elderly people? And that's probably the most important question. And there probably are approaches that one could use. Um, there, there are people at, at Wash U who developed this method called SILK, which is sort of, um, it's a, I was going to say, it's a pseudo pulse chase with a stable isotope for your, your protein of interest and then they measure what's going on in the CSF and they do some mathematical modeling. It's, and, and that might be one approach that allows this type of inference. Um, it won't be directly for lysosomes in the brain, but it, it, you could measure a brain protein in that way. So you could see if there's an obvious defect. Um, I think other than that, you know, it's a question of how, how is one going to recapitulate the real states in, um, in an old brain? But... You know, the point you make is correct. We, we've got to, it's something we need to worry about. 
um, and try to design experiments to test. I don't know if yes. you've got any other way out of this. Professor Wolf Brunk, um, who recently retired from the University of Linköping in Sweden, um, found that he could grow cells in culture under high oxygen conditions to accelerate the accumulation of lipofuscin in the Petri dishes. And it occurred to me that perhaps we could find a way to induce the lysosomes to exocytose their extra lipofuscin so wow. that it would, would be renewed. Yeah, so it's very interesting. So, I mean, I think there are two points. I mean, you you can, there is a literature and, um, suge you know, sh suggesting that if you if you do that on mass in the lysosomes, in, in a cell's lysosomes, then you do cause defects. And I think that what I was trying to say badly is that in the neurons of an aged person, where there's some lipofuscin positivity, the question is, are there other lysosomes that can do the trick? Um, and that is, you know, I don't know the answer to it, but I suspect that probably are. Um, but, you know, it's something we need to bear in mind and we need to think about and design experiments for. I'm really glad you brought up this issue of um, secretion, a lysosomal secretion, because um, by chance, as, as, as a... We, of course, we do these screens for compounds um, that induce clearance of proteins we're interested in or um, that protect. We did a screen, for instance, of a zebrafish tauopathy model, a chemical screen. Um, and one of our hits, which reduced the levels of the mutant protein, was actually working through increased secretion. Yes. And so I, and I, I agree that, that this is. I agree that this is an important area for research. Yeah, I, I from what I've seen, from what I've seen, the um, lysosomes will merge with the plasma membrane Correct. during um, cell division, but this doesn't help the cardiomyocytes or neurons. Which well, we've done, go I should say we've done, it works in zebrafish, in proper neurons in zebrafish, and um, we have data, we haven't, oh, we've got data in mice with the same compound, which I think works at, le at least as far as we can see by increasing secretion. And for what it's worth, the compound reduces tau levels and ameliorates the only sign, the only, uh, can I say, um, cognitive features that we see at the mice at that age, a novel argument recognition. So um, I think that um, exploring the pros and cons of that type of a strategy um, might be valuable. Thank you. That's very it, helpful. It, it will work in neurons. I'm not worried about that. They, they, yeah. Thank All you. All right. Uh, we'll leave it at this. And next one up, we have Kevin. Yeah. Hi there, uh, David. It's an uh, awesome, great work, a wonderful, you know, overview of, of everything that I needed to remember from, from my classes in autophagy. And now I, I always keep coming now back to you the potential of feedback loops um, existing from degradation and the loss of energy in the pro of the proton gradient of mitochondria sort of maybe might mimic or mirror the loss of the proton gradient in the acidification of the lysosome. And it just seems that maybe there's a lot of things going down or wrong at the same time as a result of the, the loss of energy early on in the accumulation or the generation of the pathologies. Would you think that um, increasing, uh, you know, the potential for acidification or the loss, or preventing the loss of acidification early, would avoid some of these uh, downstream consequences? I'm very glad you mentioned that. So, my friend Randy Nixon has done very elegant work, and I think very important work on lysosomes in the context of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and his data that are published and some that are going to come out very, to me, show very clearly that loss of lysosomal acidification and loss of lysosomal enzymatic function as a consequence, because the enzymes need the right pH to work, um, is likely to be an important driving force yeah. in Alzheimer's disease. I mean, you know, I think you can't talk about Alzheimer's aging without talking about Alzheimer's disease. And um, 
so um, in that context, certainly once the disease is established, one has the type of situation that John is talking about, you know, where many of the lysosomes aren't working. Um, it, it, things might be different at different stages or different ages, but, you know, certainly in established Alzheimer's disease, Randy's data to me look very strong. Yeah. And um, so I, in fact, I saw him two weeks ago and we had a long chat because I think, I think we both agreed with what you were saying, that we need to think quite hard about um, either normalizing lysomal acidification or see if there are ways we can um, enhance lysomal enzyme function. Um, early, so, early. Take out yeah. the garbage early. Yeah. It's well, yeah. So I think that um, it's certainly um, a domain that I'm going to start thinking about a little, a lot harder. Well, I'm, um, I'll be looking forward to uh, watching the this, this space there because I, I have a feeling that it's a lot easier to enhance the, this acidification um, than we think, and that it's not just in your neurons, it's obviously, you know, everything you need, lysosomes in all of your cells. So you're only noticing when things start going wrong because you are cognitively aware of the loss of brain function uh, a lot more than you are in the wrinkles on your face and the loss of uh, muscle function, et cetera. But thank, thank you for that. It's a very important topic. Yeah. Great, that's a fit for thought. Next one we have Aaron. Hey, yeah. Um, so I was just going to ask, what age-related changes are at the root of autophagy, uh, autophagy degradation? I think you mentioned earlier something about Yaptas. I didn't quite <laughs> understand that. And then, is it just is it just genetic mutations over time, or is it um, other things? They're at the root cause of like. Oh. I think you're asking a question I can't answer. So, uh, we've done we've done a fair amount of work. It's YAPTAS are transcriptional co-activators. So there are proteins that bind to transcription factors. In fact, a transcription factor that's called TEAD, and and it sort of enhances its activity. It's it's one of the downstream players for what it's worth in the hippo pathway. Um, if you remember that, um. That signaling pathway. Um, the the, the YAPTAS signaling, the, the only information that I am aware of, that I understand, is that the levels of um, the, the, this, this, this protein that negatively impacts that pathway, so that the next, the levels of the transcript and the protein go up with age in mice and people. And I think it's one of the contributors to the decreased autophagosome biogenesis with age. I, what I would also say is that I don't know why it goes up with age. And if that's the question you're asking, we've got more work cut out. Um, and, you know, I could hypothesize many things, but that is probably something that we need to think about quite carefully. Um, I can't help all. We've just, no problem. Yeah, that, we just that sounds good. Paper, but it's an absolutely fair point. Awesome. Sounds good. There's, for what it's worth, I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, we need to look at it and think about it. Thank you. More <laughs> All right. Wonderful. Next one here, Abdul Kader. Yes. Uh, nice to meet you. A uh, very interesting nice presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is, I was wondering whether uh, there are cases where upregulations of uh, autophagy causes a disease. Uh, that's one question. The other. If we do it one at a time, is that okay? I'll okay. do it the first one first, yeah. and the second one second. Yeah. Okay. The, so I'm not aware of that in humans. Okay. There is this concept which I think is probably largely an artifact called autophagic cell death, where you see increased numbers of autophagosomes in dying cells. And it was considered one of the forms of non-apoptotic cell death. However, I believe that that occurs in the Drosophila fat body. That doesn't worry me very much. Um, but I think in most other circumstances where it's been described, it's very difficult to know if it's real. And I, I give you two reasons. The first reason we don't know if it's real is that 
the experiments that have been done in more recent years to try to um, demonstrate that. So the first problem is all the experiments it, are that if you block autophagosome lysosome fusion, so if you treat a cell with a high dose of chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, um, you will, and if it gets into the cell, it'll block the lysosomes, it'll affect lysosomal acidification, the cells will die, and there'll be many more autophagosomes because they're not fusing with the lysosome. Okay. Um, and so that's not, you, you're not, the cells aren't dying because they've got more autophagy. They've got, they dying with more autophagosomes because there's a lysosomal problem. So in order to try to uh, disentangle that problem, what people have done is they've done this, the experiment where they expose cells to a, per, a perturbant, which are either wild type cells or autophagy null cells. Um, and then they say, well, um, the cell death is not occurring in the autophagy null cells, so this is autophagic cell death. And I think that that is, again, trivializing the problem. Um, uh, the analogy I always make, it, what that shows is that the cell death is dependent on the cells being able to perform some autophagy. But it doesn't mean anything more than that, or it doesn't necessarily mean anything more than that. And the analogy I use for everybody is... Um, It, you need ATP to undergo apoptosis. Would anybody say that, you know, ATP is causing apoptosis? Never. So that's, those are the reasons why I'm most, I'm rather speculative about most reports of so-called autophagic cell death. You can make transgenic animals, C. elegans, Drosophila, mice, that have constitutively hyperactive autophagy and they generally live longer and they're happy and protect against most diseases. There are one or two situations where um, there's slightly increased uh, susceptibility, but overall they're better off um, and they have less cancer risk and less neurodegeneration risk. So that's the first question. Okay. Yeah. The second question is, uh, uh, we know that some viruses actually inhibit uh, autophagy. So I was wondering, if we have a chronic uh, infection with the virus, would that accelerate aging? Uh, is that something explored in a more? Uh, well, I don't. I, the first statement is correct. Uh, in fact, our favorite virus of the time is supposed to affect autophagy somewhat. Um, the question is whether they, if you had a crop, well, I'm not a virologist, but. I would have thought that most of the viruses with chronic um, infection are effectively latent most of the time. So, um, so viruses like herpes virus or CMV or EBV, I think they latent most of the time. So they, you know, they they're not doing their stuff. Um, so I'm not sure that there is a situation where you've got sort of an active virus all the time in your cells that would would be a culprit in that sense. But it's an interesting idea. All right. Thank you so much. Um, we have a bunch more questions and only 30 more minutes to go. Uh, so I will ask the question from Micah, who has no mic. Do you believe or do you have data that shows either way that autophagy induced via fasting will have a significant impact on age-related neurodegenerative diseases? And can that be as effective as other interventions? Yeah, so this I have slick, okay? So the problem with the fasting, so I suspect many of the people on the call um, think about this a lot. The problem with the fasting literature is that 24 hours fasting for a mouse, which is probably what you need to get autophagy going in the brain, um, is like seven days fasting for a person. So... I'm not sure there are any data suggesting that that will work for a person with, with whether those types of fasting regimes. That might be a function of what you can measure. The autophagy assays are a little bit blunt. And so it's formally possible that if you fast for, you know, eight hours or 12 hours, you might induce some autophagy, but it's very difficult to measure. And that might be beneficial. 
but I don't know. Um, and, and that's my main concern. You know, how does one really do the experiments? And until one's got good readouts for autophagy and protein clearance to the brain, um, I think that's still an open question. Okay, wonderful. And now we have Larry next to raise his hand for a while. Yeah, hi, David. A, a really good presentation. I was going to ask you um, for philodipine, which, you know, it isn't a widely used calcium channel blocker, but, but it is used. And did you see any, any real world evidence that it may be delayed neural degeneration, you know, perhaps? Some yeah, other? thank you for asking. So um, when I give a longer talk, I've got a slide showing that people have done, there have been a number of studies as well as meta-analyses that have looked at philodipine or other L-type calcium channel blockers that get into the brain and compared them to L-type calcium channel blockers that don't get into the brain or people taking anti other antihypertensives or people taking nothing. And they find that the use of philodipine or the L-type calcium channel blockers that get into the brain appears to be associated with a decreased risk of subsequently developing Parkinson's disease compared to um, the other categories. So that fits with the religion. Um, there are other explanations, um, and I think sometimes a little bit of caution is warranted because these are opportunistic epidemiological studies, um, and so um, that they can be associated with some error. But, um, you know, overall, it, it fits with the idea. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Um, we have another question from Aaron here. I was just going to throw this, uh, it's kind of a low priority question. Is any muscular dystrophy associated with um, like over, over regulation of autophagy? I, some, for some reason I remember hearing about that, but then you mentioned that there's no. Um, no, no, there was this, there is a disease where, but that is, that's essentially got a block at the level of the lysosome. So they have more autophagosomes in that disease, but there's a, actually, there's no more autophagy. They just got, Effectively, autophagy constipation, autophagy on ah, Okay. Okay. All right. Wonderful. I think those are all the questions that we have from uh, the group. I can't let you go, though, without asking the few template standard questions, um, which is one of them. One I think that's you know, really most important if people are getting really, really excited about your research now um, and about your work. What is the number one thing in which they can really help support your work and your research going forward? Um, well, I think the, you know, I alluded to this problem earlier. I think that a big challenge is to see if we can find ways of measuring or inferring indirectly of autophagy in the brains of people. I mean, ultimately, I think we all more interest in our brains than anything else. You know, as some, uh, John, did John say, you know, he's, or Kevin said, he's more worried about his brains than his wrinkles. You know, so I think that's a, that's absolutely correct. And so um, we need to see if we can develop methods for that. Um, and that will be very important for, for the whole field. Um, and will allow, you know, scientists to answer the types of very good questions you've been all, all asking. So I think that's one, one area that's important. Um, you know, I, it, that's the most immediate um, translational question. The other types of things we're interested in are really um, getting a better understanding of what autophagy really does in cells, because um, a lot of the work that's been done has been done sort of one target by at a time. Um, and so, you know, I, we're trying to develop strategies for that. Um, what else is important? And we just need to understand more about the biology and the signals so that we can understand how it relates to disease. It, it's very interesting when the more we've done on the biology, the more clues we've got about its roles in various diseases. Um, and um, also to develop youth um, strategies for autophagy upregulation. I think, you know, with all um, therapeutic discovery, you never know what's going to work in people at the end. So you need a repertoire of options. But the, I think, you know, my, my, the number one real roadblock is this issue of the measurements in people. 
Okay, I think Kevin has a follow-up here. Yeah, well, I'm just thinking, uh, so lately I've been working in metabolomics and looking at phospholipids, the variety and the breadth and diversity that are required for appropriate membrane function. And of course, this includes neurotransmitters and anything a membrane would possibly be used for, which I'm assuming would be autophagosomes and lysosomes as well. Do you know if there's a uh, change in the composition and the diversity of the phospholipids and what that change might be? I do know that um, the ether-linked phospholipids, uh, the plasmalogens, uh, are associated with different phase changes uh, in the membrane fluidity, which allow membrane vesicles to fuse uh, faster or slower, depending on that, that percentage of plasmalogens in the membrane. Uh, especially for neurotransmitters, it's a uh, yeah. it's a bit of fusion a fusion event just happening. Yeah. We've done it's... lipidomics on isolated autophagosomes, and they not unexpectedly have you know unique, but they've they've got they've certainly got a um, a trademark. Um, I think the question is, you know, how one goes from there to to inferring what's going on in a person's brain. Um, sure. And I, you know, I think the route in is to try to understand what you can get from CSF, um, but there might be other strategies you could use. There, so we've, there was at least from a plasmalogen perspective, association with Alzheimer's disease. Um, they've shown uh, in studies done in conjunction with the Alzheimer's Association, uh, I think even MIT, various others, um, that the increase that as your plasmalogen levels decrease from venous blood draws, you have a five up to a five-fold greater chance of getting dementia and actually early death. So plasmalogen levels are have been cor and independently correlated by other labs I work with. So it, it's an important phospholipid. It's destroyed by your digestion. So you can't eat your way into a different uh, higher value if you're deficient. And it's synthesized by your liver and by muscles in response to resistance training. So um, it seems to be a very core critical component of plasma membranes in general, and maybe it has some effect on autophagy and races. Well, we'll check about that. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Okay. With four more minutes left, um, I think you already mentioned a little bit in terms of uh, what others can do to support your work, but uh, if we, one thing that we'd like to do is always generate pretty well-defined challenges that we could perhaps even post other folks working in the area. If someone new to the field, like let's say a uh, new talent streams in, um, is there like a specific thing that they could be tackling um, that uh, would be very useful? And I think you already like mentioned a few ideas here, but is there something like pretty well-defined almost that if someone was listening to this and actually wanted to start a research project uh, could get on? This is a difficult question, I know, yeah. but I've been well, I think, you know, just... Yeah, I think, Alison, it's just, you know, it's a question of urgency and tractability. So the things that are tractable, we try to do. I mean, you know, I remember once a, a, a colleague of mine who was wiser than I was at the time said, you know, science is the art of the tractable. So, you know, I think what you've got to do is chase the things that are tractable that are going to give you the greatest insights. Um, but I think that, you know, this issue of measuring the autophagy in people is a big challenge. I think it is tractable. I mean, you know, I've, I have strategies. I've, I've just got to find a way of funding them. And, they, and it's high risk. So it's, you know, it, because essentially what I want to know is not actually so much um, what is the autophagy status in person X versus person Y. I'm much more interested in knowing if I give a person person X a drug, does this induce autophagy in the brain? Because if you want to do drug discovery, um, an ideal prerequisite is to be able to assess mechanism engagement. So if you can show that the actual mechanism, the autophagy or the clearance of the protein you're interested in is enhanced by your drug, um, then you've learned a lot. I mean, we can see this now with, you know, the aducanumab story and Alzheimer's disease. So you, I'm sure you know the story. You know, so they've got an antibody that reduces a beta, but it's not affecting cognitive function. Maybe I'm saying that too strongly. But 
it's telling you something. It, it, you know, it, it, they, it, it, at least you know what to balance uh, your next experiments around. And I think that, um, that, and that's why it's so important to be able to have this type of a marker. Um, I think, you know, pet ligands are improving for many of the proteins I'm interested in. Um, and that might be one way of going as well. Um, but, you know, I think there are other strategies that people should look at. Well, then it seems like a bottleneck and a challenge is funding. <laughs> okay, wonderful. Well, we're one minute now um, ahead of schedule. So thank you so, so much from the entire group for you uh, joining us and being willing to take all of our questions. It was really, really wonderful to have you on board. Uh, we hope it wasn't the last time in this research is, you know, clearly super, super interesting for many folks that are doing much of the longevity work in this space. So thank you so, so much. It was really great. You're getting a few like celebratory uh, icons here. Um, and yeah, I hope it wasn't the last time that we, uh, that we see you. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Cheers, Alison. Bye-bye.